Hello friends, good morning. My name is Arpit and I am here with today's analysis. Today is 26th of August and we are going to cover very most important topics not only from prelims point of view but also from the mains point of view. So let's get started with today's topics. We are going to cover three important topics. First is the Northern Sea Route NSR. It is basically a trade route from I would say the western part of Russia to the eastern part of Russia traversing just south of the Arctic Circle. Now this trade route has become very much important for India because India's trade in the recent past particularly the energy imports have increased from Russia. Now we will see the gaining importance of this trade route for India. We will see the presence of India in the Arctic region right from I would say the 1920s till now. The gaining significance of this route and many other important aspects related to this particular route. So we will be covering all this in this. Then the next is India Greece. Now the Indian Prime Minister has visited Greece while returning from the BRICS summit. Although a brief visit but a substantial one. The last Prime Minister from India to visit Greece was in 1983, Indira Gandhi. And after that, no Prime Minister from India has visited Greece. Greece not only has talked about elevating our ties to strategic ties, but has also conferred their highest civilian honour on our Prime Minister. What are strategic ties? What will happen? What is the name of the highest civilian honor and also, you know, we'll also be looking into that how many civilian honors has our prime minister received till date. So all these things we will be covering in this particular topic. And third is kind of a follow up news. The rover Pragyan has finally, you know, come down on the surface of the moon. In today's newspaper, there was a headline reading that it has moved around eight meters and has started you know, its requisite functions. Now, there were two payloads on the rover. Those payloads have also become active as per the information coming from ISRO. So, kind of a follow-up news, but yes, important to know the payloads. We'll discuss about the payloads in brief. So, let's get started with the first topic, that is the Northern Sea Route. Now, in this particular topic, we're going to discuss about the significance of this sea route for India. So let's first understand where is this sea route. This is the Arctic Circle, the North Pole. Here is basically a city called as Murmansk. Murmansk is on the western side of Russia. And this dotted line which you see is the Northern Sea Route, NSR we call it. Now, India's presence or activities on the Murmansk post or Murmansk port, sorry, has increased in the recent past. That is why this is in news. Why it has increased? Obviously, energy imports from Murmansk. So, why in news? Because Murmansk, it is popularly called as the capital of the Arctic region also because maximum economic activity happens on the Murmansk port over there in the Arctic region. It is the beginning point of the Northern Sea Route and is witnessing a rising trend of Indian involvement in cargo traffic on this port. In the first seven months of 2023, that is from January till July, India got the lion's share with 35% of the 8 million ton car cargo handled on the Murmansk port was Indian cargo, was either directly or indirectly related to India. So, this is why this was in news and this is why this Northern Sea Route is gaining importance for us as a country and importance for you as a civil services aspirant. India has been showing greater interest regarding the NSR for a variety of reasons. We will see all those reasons in detail. Now, significance of the Arctic region for us. Now, you might have got this idea that we are, you know, we are, we are in importing energy imports from Russia. 
Russia has now become the largest supplier of oil to India. We could not think of about this particular, I would say, statistic two years or three years ago, where Russia was somewhere at seventh, eighth position. Coal imports have also increased. So this Arctic region has become significant to us. But we should not forget that this Arctic region is also prone to the climate change. I would not say that climate induced disasters, but the climate change, you know, can cause a lot of, I would say, activities which will hinder navigation in the high seas over there. So this is important for, and this is very much important for economic water and sustainability. The second is the region is also constituting the largest unexplored prospective area for hydrocarbons. Now, Mr. Shyam Saran, former foreign secretary, he gave this estimate that the world's largest hydrocarbon resources or reserves like the petroleum and natural gas reserves can be in the Arctic region. He went on to say that around 40% of India, uh, sorry, 40% of the global, you know, hydrocarbon reserves can be found in the Arctic region. So, if this turns out to be true or even if a, if a fraction of it turns out to be true, then definitely it will be of much significance to us because we have already presence over there in that region. However, government's Arctic policy of 2022, which we released last year, mentions that the country's approach to the economic development of the region, means the Arctic region, is guided by UN Sustainable Development Goals. This simply means that we will be looking forward for sustainably developing that region, not only for exploiting that region. So we will be looking for explorations or extractions of natural gas or other resources if they are found in that region in a sustainable manner. So this is the significance of that particular region. Now, how old is India's engagement with the Arctic? Now, Arctic per se is an uncharted territory. It is an unclaimed territory. No country can say that this is ours. So similar position is with India. But yes, India has been engaging for research and development and conservation of that region since the 1920s. In 1920, we were not sovereign though, but the British Indian government signed this Svalbard Treaty in February 1920. This Svalbard Treaty basically aimed at conservation, ecological conservation of that region as well as promoting research. However, things did not proceed at that pace because the world was facing various problems at that time. In the late 1920s, the Great Depression came. Then the 1930s, 1940s, there was this, you know, atmosphere of war and Second World War happened. The major developments in the region hence happened post-1950. Now, India's engagement in the Arctic, we opened a research station named Himadri at Nyalsund Svalbard in 2008. In May 2013, India became an observer state of the Arctic Council along with five others including China. We launched our inaugural multi-sensor mood observatory in 2014 and northernmost atmospheric laboratory in 2016 in Arctic region. And last year, that is 2022, 13 expeditions to the Arctic have been successfully conducted by India. So this is our activities or these are our activities in the Arctic region. But what is NSR? We should understand this NSR, Northern Sea Route. Actually, this is the Northern Pole. You get it better now. This is the Northern Pole over here. This is the Arctic Ocean. And just south of the Arctic Ocean, this red line which you are seeing from here, the eastern part to, sorry, the western part to the eastern part of Russia, this is the Northern Sea Route. And Northern Sea Route will be very much instrumental in establishing connectivity with countries in Asia Pacific region like Japan is here, China is, you know, depending a lot on this route. And obviously, we should be also looking for establishing connectivity with India. Presently, we have a trade route which traverses through the Suez Canal and then comes to India, which is a longer route from Russia. 
Another route is through the land that is this international north-south trade corridor which ends in Bandar Abbas in Iran and then from there you know sea route is there which touches the Mumbai port. But land transport is expensive. We largely depend on sea transport. Most of our international trade around 85 to 90 percent of our international trade happens through the oceans because oceanic trade is or oceanic transport is the cheapest mode of transport. So NSR is this route and this route will further connect with India through the eastern side. So NSR is the shortest shipping route for freight transportation between Europe and countries of the Asia Pacific region. So European countries if they have to connect with the Asia Pacific countries this is the shortest route for them. Here we have Norway, Sweden, Finland and then here we have England and all. UK is here, this is UK. So it is the shortest route for them to connect with countries in Asia Pacific else they have to you know take this route which is so long. Now a top view of this particular uh, I would say NSR 5600 kilometers is the estimated length of NSR it begins at the boundary between the Barents and the Kara Sea now basically here is the Barents Sea and here is the Kara Sea so it begins somewhere here and here is the city of Murmansk and then it traverses through the Laptev Sea East Siberian Sea and then enters into the Bering Sea over here. Ends in the Bering Strait, Providenia Bay. This is the Providenia Bay, Bering Strait. This is the Northern Sea Route. In theory, the distance savings along the NSR can be as high as 50% compared to the currently used shipping lanes via the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal. Panama Canal is between you know, North America and South America. And Suez Canal is there in Africa, Egypt. Now, how is Russia making it navigable? Because see, most of the times of the year, this is actually sea bound. But, and when, when sea is there, you know, ships cannot navigate. You, you've seen that in Titanic. So, how is Russia making it navigable? How is Russia making it a kind of an all weather port? Now, this ice breaking assistance is provided or is organized to ensure safe navigation along the NSR. Russia is the only country reportedly in the world with a nuclear powered icebreaker fleet. Nuclear powered icebreaker fleet means the energy which that fleet is getting is by nuclear fuel. It is not using nuclear fuel to burn or to I would say break the ice but for navigating those ships or for you know drilling purposes whatever energy is being used is being generated by nuclear fuel that is nuclear powered icebreaker fleet according to Rosatom state nuclear energy corporation the NSR infrastructure operator they believe that ice breaking assistance is only you know available with Russia and no other country when did ice breaking start 1959 they started with this technology and they named their first nuclear icebreaker as Lenin Obviously, on the name of a freedom fighter or on the name of a historical figure in Russia was put into operation unveiling the new chapter in NSR development. It was decommissioned however 30 years later that is 1989. But now what is the scenario present scenario FSUE Atom Flot a subsidiary of Ross Atom acts as the fleet operator of nuclear powered icebreakers. There are presently seven nuclear powered icebreakers and you know one nuclear command container ship and three more are expected to be commissioned between 2024 to 2027 so in total by 2027 russia is expected to have 10 nuclear powered icebreaker fleet and because of those nuclear power icebreaker fleet they are you know removing the ice and making this northern sea route navigable you now driving factors for india what are important factors for india or how, what is the importance of NSR for India? And the growth in cargo traffic along NSR is on the constant rise. 2018 to 2022, these four, five years, the growth rate was around 73%, which is very, very remarkable. 
लास्ट ईयर द वॉल्यूम ऑफ कार्गो ट्रैफिक वॉज थर्टी फोर पॉइंट वन वन सेवन मिलियन टन विद इंडिया इंक्रीजिंगली इंपोर्टिंग क्रूड ऑयल एंड कोल फ्रॉम रशिया इन रिसेंट ईयर्स रॉज एटम से इज द रिकॉर्ड सप्लाईज ऑफ एनर्जी रिसोर्सेज फॉर द इंडियन इकोनॉमी आर पॉसिबल ड्यू टू सच अ रिलायबल एंड सेफ ट्रांसपोर्ट आर्टरी लाइक एन एस आर सेकेंडली एन एस आर एज्यूम्स इंपॉर्टेंस गिव इन इंडिया जोग्राफिक पोजिशन जोग्राफिकल लोकेशन ऑफ इंडिया इंडो पैसेफिक सो इट कैन कम फ्रॉम द ईस्टर्न साइड टू इंडिया आई जस्ट शो इट टू यू थ्रू द मैप सो दिस इज बेसिकली द नॉर्दर्न सी रूट ओवर हियर एंड फ्रॉम हियर इट कैन कम वाई आर द स्ट्रेट ऑफ मलक्का टू इंडिया इंडिया इज ऑल्सो प्लानिंग टू इस्टैब्लिश इन टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन वी वी टॉक अबाउट इट चेन्नई इज द पोर्ट ओवर हियर and vladivostok so chennai to vladivostok you know this trade route we established it is called as chennai vladivostok sea line of communication or you know chennai vladivostok maritime corridor so Chennai Vladivostok Maritime Corridor project and outcome of the signing of memorandum between both the countries in September 2009 is also being examined that NSR can connect with Vladivostok Vladivostok already connected with Chennai so this trade route can be followed what is the present trade route which we are following for imports from Russia so we should look at this we are following this trade route which is basically St Petersburg to mumbai which is a very long trade route it first traverses here then entire mediterranean ocean then this is here the suez canal suez canal is here so this is 8675 nautical miles roughly 16000 kilometers and this is 5647 nautical miles roughly i would say 10000 to 12 11000 kilometers this proposed i would say chennai vladivostok maritime corridor or chennai vladivostok sea line of communication from here nsr can be extended to india so this is basically the importance the travel time will reduce to 12 days now presently it takes around 36 days for any product to come from russia to india via this sea route so this is this is very much important and both the countries are believing this fact that in the times to come trade is going to increase also another reason for you know us to focus on the northern sea route is china's presence is increasing over there so it should not be that china blocks our trade from there because our trade is coming happening so it should not be like that so we should also keep our positions intact on the northern sea route this is the gaining prominence of this will it you know why or disturb our relations with the west definitely are any type of relations with russia will you know pose challenges for us in terms of our relations with the west but this is what we have to do in diplomacy and this is what you have to do when you become an indian foreign service officer maintain the strategic balance this is the art of diplomacy which we indians i think have mastered by now and you being the future bureaucrats have to take this forward and make it better and better so this is the then the next piece of news is india greece relations or our prime minister's visit to this small country greece but yes strategically very important country it is located on on i would say the banks of mediterranean sea just near to egypt near to turkey also so it becomes important apart from it you know this uh, our foreign minister uh, mr s jay shankar was delivering a speech in 2019 20 in the ramnath goenka foundation and in his speech he was talking about india's foreign policy and he talked about evolution of india's foreign policy divided india's foreign policy into six phases from 1950 till now 
not going into all those phases but just the present phase he termed it as the phase of energetic and aggressive engagement that is after 2014 and you know these kind of visits by the prime minister to those kind of countries where the indian prime minister has not visited ever or long back they visited like for example greece is such a country where the last indian prime minister to visit was indira gandhi way back in 1983 it has been good long 40 years israel no indian prime minister visited he was the first to visit 2017 after 2014 hence was characterized by our our foreign minister as the phase of energetic and you know aggressive agreement engagement with the world so these kind of visits do testify that now india and greece pledge to upgrade ties to become strategic partners so in this first of all we learn what strategic partnership is and you know we will we'll then move forward now the concept of strategic partnership now it is a partnership between two states or two countries with common values where the states decide to cooperate with each other on multiple dimensions means partnership will be there on multiple dimensions these dimensions can be economic cooperation cultural cooperation energy cooperation technological cooperation and most importantly security cooperation this has to be there among other levels of or other domains of cooperation now what do we mean by security cooperation security cooperation does not mean that if any country attacks greece we are going to attack that country on behalf of greece no or any country attacks india greece is going to attack that country on behalf of india no that is not security cooperation security cooperation simply pertains to defense trade maritime exercises various agreements like intelligence sharing agreement and things like this where you cooperate with each other on security terms to and the main objective of security cooperation is to strengthen overall security of both the countries that is security cooperation the overall strategic partnership is where you know countries engage with each other on multiple fronts among them security cooperation is you know mandatory and the most important so india and greece on friday agreed to upgrade bilateral ties to level of strategic partnership you now know what strategic partnership is the two countries will collaborate in the field of defense obviously and will soon conclude an agreement on migration mobility to smoothen movement of skilled population on both the sides so here we are also talking about people to people contacts cultural contacts so cultural co cooperation is also being talked about now other points of discussion between both the leaders they talked about freedom of navigation as you know greece acknowledged the fact that there are various concerns in the indo pacific where india is situated as well as in the eastern part of mediterranean uh, mediterranean uh, sea where greece is located so we need to address them and we need to address them as per the international law and convention on law of the sea un convention on law of the seas it has to be addressed in this manner both sides have agreed to boost defense industries and military links obviously strategic partnership will entail this will promote cultural and academic exchanges between educational institutions and increase people to people contacts cultural cooperation was also part of strategic partnership so yes greece seeks investments from indian entities economic cooperation is also part of you know strategic partnership so economic cultural and security partnership they are talking about as of now highest honor to india's pm now india's pm was conferred with the grand cross of the order of honor by the greek president katerina sakelero polu now this is the award being received by the prime minister of india is this the first award of this kind which has been received by the prime minister no i took this image from you know my gov india's 
uh, Instagram page and actually till date India has, uh, sorry, the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi has received 15 civilian honours from across the globe from various countries. So let us look into the name of the countries also from where these awards have come. In 2023 alone, that is this year, Greece, France, Egypt, Republic of Palau, Papua New Guinea and Fiji. They have conferred civilian honours on our Prime Minister. In 2021, two years ago, Bhutan, Order of the Druk Gyalpo was given. 2020, US Government's Legion of Merit Award was given to Narendra Modi for elevating India-US relationships to new heights. Just imagine, from 2005 till 2014, there was a travel ban on him in USA. And he's being receiving civilian honours from USA now. 2016, Afghanistan, State Order of Ghazi Amir Amanullah Khan. Then, Saudi Arabia, Order of King Abul, Abdul Aziz, this was given. 2018, Palestine offered or conferred him. 2019, Bahrain, Maldives, Russia and UAE. So, 15 civilian honours for our Prime Minister till now, means till yesterday, when, you know, Greece conferred. So, this list should be there in your head. This clearly signifies the stature of India and obviously the stature of our Prime Minister. So this should be taken into account. And now the last piece of news which is kind of a follow up news. Rover Pragyan lands on the moon and Pragyan traverses 8 meters on moon. This is the photo which was released by ISRO in which you can see the Pragyan rover rolling down from the lander, Vikram. Now, what is the Pragyan rover going to do? We need to know that. First of all, it is going to be active for 14 days or one lunar day. And it is going to conduct various experiments. Now there are payloads, payloads are kind of sensors on it or instruments, you know, mounted on it. Those instruments will be collecting various informations and sending those informations back to India. So first payload is Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer, APXS. It will measure the chemical composition and infer the mineralogical composition of the moon's surface. What kind of minerals are present, in what quantity, in what composition they are present. This alpha particle X-ray spectrometer is going to do that. It will be releasing X-rays, then receiving the X-rays from the particles. And then, you know, in this way, they, it will be analyzing what kind of, I would say, minerals are there. Next is laser induced breakdown spectroscope, LIBS. Now, what this LIBS will do, it will, you know, shoot laser beams into the surface of the moon. It will melt the surface of the moon. Surface of the moon is called as regolith. And then it will analyze the gases coming from it. From beneath the surface of the moon. Means we are also going to know about what is inside the surface of the moon. What kind of gases are present. Like we have the earth, the crust mantle core. So we don't know much about the inside of the moon. So this experiment can give us details about the inside of the moon. So this is the job of, I would say, Pragyan, the rover for the next 14 days and, you know, technical data will be received. No need to go into the much of the technicalities, but yes, what major findings will be there, I'll let you know. Don't worry on that. I'll simplify things and let you know. Tomorrow's session, we'll be talking about the Prime Minister's address to the scientists of ISRO today. And, you know, we'll also be talking about the National Science Day, the Shiv Shakti point, the Tiranga point and all which he mentioned. Those become important for prelims point of view. So this is all from today's session. I'll be meeting you with much such exciting news in tomorrow's session. Also, don't forget to mention in the comment box what kind of topics you want to cover. So if they'll be feasible, I will definitely be covering them for you 
will be simplifying them and covering it them for you till then keep studying keep revising keep reading that is it from today's session jai hind